The Apple M1 blew us away last year when it debuted in the new MacBook Air and 13-inch MacBook Pro. Now Apple is back with a new set of M1 variants and a new 14-inch and 16-inch MacBook Pro laptop. The new M1 Max and M1 Pro are crazy fast and raise the bar for laptop performance, but they are not without their quirks. Welcome to Upscaled, our tech explainer show where we break down the chips making all your old MacBook Pros obsolete. A quick refresher on the M1. After years of using Intel chips in their computers, the M1 was Apple's first attempt at building its own laptop chip. Essentially a very modified version of their A14 mobile chip, the M1 paired four high-powered and four low-powered processor cores with an either 7 or 8 core GPU. Despite being adapted from an iPhone processor, the M1 was seriously fast, matching or besting an 8-core Intel i9-powered 16-inch MacBook Pro in most of our tests last year, and coming within striking distance of a high-powered 16-core desktop computer. More impressively, it did all of this while consuming under 30 watts of power. In a lot of our tests, that Intel-powered MacBook Pro would have its fans blasting away and be uncomfortably hot to the touch, while the M1-powered 13-inch MacBook Pro stayed quiet and cool. But the M1 wasn't without issues. It maxed out at 16 gigabytes of RAM, and the 8 gigabyte model could have issues with even just having too many browser tabs open. Its GPU, while still very efficient and pretty good for an integrated graphics processor, was also just not particularly powerful. The M1 Pro and M1 Max seem designed to fix all of these problems. The Pro can come with up to 32 gigabytes of RAM, all the way up to 64 gigs on the M1 Max. The number of GPU cores has also been increased from 14 on the base Pro all the way up to 32 again on the max. Both of these chips also only have two of the low-powered E cores now, and eight of the high-powered P cores. Well, the lowest model of the Pro technically only has six P cores, but we aren't testing that one today, and we don't really recommend it. In some ways, this is just a less exciting release than the original M1. It's the same cores, the same GPU, there's just more of it. On the other hand, this is the first truly powerful mobile hardware, especially mobile graphics, that we've seen from an Apple laptop in years. So essentially we've got twice the number of high performance P cores, two to four times the number of GPU cores, and up to 64 gigabytes of memory brought over. In addition, we also have the M1's neural engine for AI calculations, its image processor, and a new dedicated chip for Apple's proprietary codec ProRes, which is a staple of high-end production. I am recording this in ProRes right now. These new M1 chips are brought together into an SoC with some insane memory bandwidth. Now, memory bandwidth is essentially a measure of how quickly data can move back and forth from the RAM to the processing parts of the chip. For comparison, the original M1 had a memory bandwidth of 68.25 gigabytes per second, which is about the same as AMD's high-end Ryzen 9 5980 HX laptop chip. The M1 Pro boosts that memory bandwidth to 200 gigabytes a second, and the M1 Max doubles that again to an insane 400 gigabytes a second. Most high-end server chips with eight channels of memory don't even hit 200 gigabytes a second, so this is just ridiculous and leagues above pretty much every other laptop processor. That said, that number doesn't tell the entire story. That memory bandwidth figure is the total transfer speed available to the entire SoC, the CPU, the GPU, and all those accelerators but it's not necessarily available to every single core. With only one core in use, other reviewers found the M1 Max's max bandwidth to be 102 gigabytes a second, though in my testing it rarely got past 90, with the exception of one outlier that was at 118. Adding more cores brings more capacity, but theoretically the chip maxes out at about 224 gigabytes a second running on four cores. Oddly, the low-powered E cores seem to have their own separate connections, so with six threads you can actually get to 240 gigabytes a second as long as two of those processes are running on the low-powered cores. Now this is a far cry from the CPU having a direct 400 gigabyte per second link into the memory, but I really don't think that matters. Even 100 gigabytes a second is still faster than the total bandwidth for pretty much any non-server processor, and again that's for a single core here. 200 gigabytes a second is still just ridiculous for pretty much any chip. In trying to run some real-world work tests, say, for example, simultaneously rendering 17 4K streams of video, I had trouble actually pushing the bandwidth past about 40 gigabytes a second. Adding in the GPU and the most demanding real-world tests I could come up with peaked at about 300 gigabytes a second, and 240 gigabytes of that was on the GPU. 
So what's the point of all this? Well, if you're only interested in CPU performance, there is no reason to get the M1 Max over the M1 Pro. Despite having only half the memory bandwidth in the memory stress testing stream benchmark, the M1 Pro was still able to access about 90 gigabytes a second with one core. In the same video rendering test that pushed the M1 Max all the way to 300 gigabytes a second, the M1 Pro was still able to do about 170 gigabytes a second. So you don't need to worry about the M1 Pro being held back by memory bandwidth at all. The CPU still gets access to the same crazy fast bandwidth speeds that the Max does, and with only a maximum of 16 GPU cores, the graphics side actually can't crunch data fast enough to need higher speeds. In one machine learning test using TensorFlow, which did run partly on the GPU, both machines used the same 45 or so gigabytes a second of bandwidth with the M1 Pro finishing only two seconds slower than the M1 Max. On the flip side, if you are getting the M1 Max because you're interested in tapping into its higher GPU power, you may as well spend the extra money to get the full 32 GPU cores. Before we get fully into that GPU, I put out the call online to see what kind of tests you folks would like to see run on these computers. As a professional video producer who likes video games, that tends to be where my testing expertise lies, but I wanted to see what we could do. You folks had some strange requests, and a lot of them I couldn't accomplish, either because I don't actually have the expertise, or we didn't have the right hardware, or the software you want to know about straight up just doesn't run on Macs. But we did what we could. For our test today, we've got the 14-inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Pro, 32 gigabytes of RAM, and a 16-core GPU. We've also got the M1 Max in a 16-inch MacBook Pro with 64 gigs of RAM and the full 32 GPU cores. For comparison, we've also got an older 8-core Intel i9 16-inch MacBook Pro with 32 gigabytes of RAM, and for some tests, a Windows desktop with a 16-core AMD 5950 CPU, a Radeon 7 graphics card, and a 128 gigabytes of RAM. First off, we tried Blender, the 3D modeling software. While it runs fine on the new M1 MacBook Pros, it's not very well optimized yet. For one, it doesn't really use the GPU, so in program, the previewing performance can be pretty slow. In the Blender benchmark, performance between the Pro and the Max was pretty much identical, which you would expect if neither of them is really using the GPU and they were only slightly faster than the Intel MacBook Pro, and much slower than our desktop computer. Someone out there asked about JavaScript performance, and in the Web Expert 3 benchmark in Safari, again, both the Pro and the Macs are almost identical, though here they are about 40% faster than the Intel MacBook. In a few tests using TensorFlow, again, the Pro and the Macs were only a few seconds apart, but were nearly twice as fast as the Intel Mac. And there was also a request to see how long it took to open a large Excel file. Um, again, I can't really see this being that big of a problem for any modern laptop, but in a 100 megabyte Excel file with more than 5 million entries, the M1s both did it in about 13 seconds versus 17 seconds for the Intel Mac. By the way, Numbers, Apple's own spreadsheeting program, took nearly three minutes to open the same file, truncated off part of the data, and is garbage. In gaming, performance was mixed. The M1 Pro was generally 15 to 50% faster than the Intel Mac, and the M1 Max was usually again about 50 to 100% faster than the Pro. This means for most games, the M1 Max was excellent at 1080 resolution and still playable at 2560. A few standouts. At a native resolution of 3456 by 2234 pixels, Metro Exodus at high settings was a totally playable 50 or so frames per second on the M1 Max, and Shadow of the Tomb Raider at highest graphics settings and 2560 resolution came in at 56 frames per second. This isn't quite NVIDIA 3080 performance, but one thing to note, almost none of the games we tested at the moment are native on the M1. They're all being run through Rosetta, Apple's Intel to M1 translator software, which does incur a performance penalty. There is one exception, Disco Elysium, which, while not a terribly graphically intense game, is actually optimized for the M1 hardware. With all of the graphics settings turned up to the max, it only managed 28 frames per second on the Intel MacBook, but 74 on the M1 Pro, and a whopping 116 on the M1 Max. Now, I'm not sure how many older games are gonna retroactively get M1 optimized versions, but if more new games going forward support the hardware, these could actually be decent gaming machines. But let's be honest, gaming has never really been Mac's strong 
suit. And Apple is clearly marketing these devices primarily towards video editors and content creators. And here, these devices really do shine. To try to see how well these chips would do and to gauge the impact of those ProRes accelerator chips, I set up a series of 10 second sequences in Premiere Pro and exported the video out to both MP4 and to ProRes. The results were extremely impressive. On both M1 laptops, the computers were able to play back four 4K ProRes video clips simultaneously at full resolution with no dropped frames. Heck, the M1 Max was even able to play back 17 simultaneous 4K ProRes clips at half resolution with only the tiniest hiccup. Exporting these clips out, the M1 Max was able to convert the 4K 4-clip sequence to MP4 in just 6 seconds, about twice as fast as my AMD desktop. And it was able to convert it to ProRes in just 11 seconds, which was three times faster than the desktop. The M1 Pro matched the 16-core desktop converting to MP4, but was twice as fast converting to ProRes. For the 17-clip sequence, there was really no difference in times between exporting to MP4 or to ProRes, but the desktop managed it in a minute and 15 seconds, the M1 Pro did it in a minute and 24, and the M1 Max did it in a mere 33 seconds. It really seems like transfer speed and memory bandwidth might be the limiting factor here, and this is definitely the test where are those extra GPU cores, extra bandwidth, and extra ProRes Accelerator seem to come in useful. Now, I actually started this testing all the way back in November when we first got our hands on these laptops. Since then, the holidays and CES and things have kind of gotten in the way. And in the meantime, Adobe has released a new version of Premiere Pro, version 22.1.2, that is actually supposed to improve the 8K performance of the M1 laptops. Previously, on the version I was using, flat version 22 from October 2021, Premiere could only take advantage of the ProRes Accelerator and, in fact, some MP4 Accelerator acceleration up to 4K resolution. This most recent update, 22.1.2, is supposed to allow Premiere to use the ProRes Accelerator all the way up to 8K footage. I reran a few tests this week with the new version, but it's safe to say I got some slightly odd results. In the best case scenario, with the most current version of Adobe's software, exports actually got faster by between 10 and 40%, which is not insignificant, but in some cases, the export processing time was instead 10 to 40 times slower for reasons that I cannot explain. Googling around online, I'm not finding many other people having this problem, so I'm not sure what has gone wrong, and I'm not including all of these results until I can figure out exactly what's happened. If you want maybe slightly more reliable software and you are just working with 4K, you could stick to that Adobe version 22. Otherwise, uh, roll the dice with 22.1.2. Maybe your processing speeds will get a little quicker. Maybe they'll be 40 times slower. Moving to a clip made from five 8K RED files, there was a bit of a shift. Without the advantage of working with ProRes, both the M1 Pro and Max slipped behind the desktop. They were able to convert that clip to an 8K MP4 in about two minutes, but the AMD desktop did it in 58 seconds. If I downscaled the export to a 4K MP4 file, the computers were able to do it in about 45 seconds, which is still impressively fast, but the desktop did it in only 16 seconds. Here, though, is where the Intel MacBook Pro totally lost steam. It had kept up okay with the M1 computers through the 4K tests, but working with 8K footage, the export took it 14 minutes and 31 seconds. Finally, I had a sequence of four 12K video clips from a Blackmagic camera. Now, using Blackmagic's codec, these files were actually smaller than the 8K RED footage, so disk access speed and that memory bandwidth should be less of an issue. And in fact, all of the computers were relatively fast at using this to produce a 4K MP4. Though, all the laptops did slow down quite a bit, making a 12K MP4. Exporting to 12K ProRes is where things got weird. The AMD desktop managed the job in about two and a half minutes, which is just about as long as it took it to produce a 12K MP4, but the M1 Max dropped all the way down to taking eight minutes to process this job, and the M1 Pro took 41 minutes. I was kind of surprised by these results, and I reran the test a few times, but at its best, the M1 Pro took 39 minutes to produce a 12K ProRes file, while the Intel Mac did it in 20. 
And here's where I need to talk about the M1 Pro a little bit, because while it was pretty darn fast on some of these tests, it also showed some problems. Even freshly restarted and with no other programs open, on every test after the initial four clip sequence, I got out of memory errors. I ran all of these tests multiple times, and the exports crashed twice each on the 16 clip sequence and the 8K test. On the 12K ProRes test, it failed three times before I successfully got it to complete an export. It did manage to do the 12K converted to 4K ProRes test without any crashes, but it took 49 minutes to do so. 10 times longer than the M1 Max. I don't know if this was a glitch in Premiere, a firmware issue, just a bad chip or what, but I got out of memory issues on the M1 Pro a lot, and it seems like I'm not the only one. Even with 32 gigabytes of RAM, it just seems like that system is hungry for more memory, and it can lead to some system instability. Some of the problems other people have seen have involved memory leaks or random programs like the activity monitor suddenly taking 20 gigabytes of RAM, but those actually didn't seem to be the problems I was having. I just got errors all the darn time. This means that if you're doing a lot of high resolution video work, which is exactly the kind of work that Apple is targeting with its advertising for these new laptops, or even if you are just doing especially complicated 4K work, it probably makes sense to shell out the extra money for the 64 gigabytes of memory with the M1 Max, even though those combined upgrades will set you back $800. I really wish we had a 32 gigabyte M1 Max here to test as well to see if it has the same problems as the Pro, but Unfortunately, we don't. Hopefully these glitches are all things that can be resolved, but still, as expensive as these computers are, at the end of the day, I would rather spend $3,899 on a laptop that actually works versus $3,000 on one that doesn't. That unpleasantness, and oh yeah, by the way, the dumb notch aside, these are probably the nicest laptops I've ever used. And the fact that any laptop can beat my ridiculous AMD desktop in a video rendering test, let alone while staying quiet and cool, shows just how fast these chips can be. Let us know what you think about these new processors. We're excited to see what Apple makes next, and we'll be here to test it out. Though I'm not sure I will have my 16-inch Intel MacBook Pro around for comparison much longer, because I am seriously considering trading it in and getting myself one of these M1 Max laptops. But until then, stay tuned to Engadget, and we'll see you next time.